Good evening. I'm Beth Solomon, the chair of the Jewish Community Relations Council, and I welcome you on behalf of the Jewish Federation of Louisville and the Jewish Community Relations Council to this year's Yom HaShoah program. Many thanks to the staff of the Jewish Community Center for making it possible for us to present this online. Hopefully we'll be able to gather together next year as this is a community-wide commemoration of Yom HaShoah or Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is my pleasure to now introduce Rabbi Beth jakowitz Chotner from Temple Shalom, who will share some of her thoughts and insights about tonight's program. In 1897, Mark Twain wrote a short yet moving piece about the Jewish people. In it, he said our numbers are so small that no one should have ever known about us, yet our contributions to society are numerous. The Jew, he wrote, has made a marvelous fight in this world, in all the ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He goes on to say that many great nations rose and fell, but the Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew, he wrote. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? I'm not sure we have a secret, so to speak, but I do believe our tradition shapes us to be resilient. Three such teachings that urge and encourage us to be resilient are living in partnership with God, valuing life, and keeping hope alive. These guideposts have allowed us to withstand repeated attempts at annihilation. From the first chapter of the first book of the Torah, we learn that we are created B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. And in Leviticus, we are told, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Our tradition speaks of our being partners with God in the creation of the world and our engaging in acts of tikkun olam, repairing the world. Because we are holy and have holy work to do, we are motivated to survive in the face of destruction. Our resilience is strengthened by the principle of pikuach nefesh, which teaches us the primacy of preserving life. This belief, coupled with the charge from Deuteronomy, uvacharta b'chayim, choose life, makes a very powerful argument for doing all we can to endure and survive. While there is no doubt that our relatives who survived Nazi Europe suffered unspeakable atrocities, crimes against humanity, most found a way to create a life for themselves after liberation. They went to school, had careers, married, raised families, and became productive members of their communities. Despite their emotional, mental and physical scars, 
They found the inner fortitude to celebrate life's blessings. They chose life. Hope is another guidepost that has kept us alive and enabled us to reach this season. To believe that the future can be better than today is powerful, but it's not a foreign concept to us. Just think of our understanding of the coming of the Messiah. The late Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs explained the connection between hope and Jews, saying, to be a Jew is to be an agent of hope in a world serially threatened by despair. Every ritual, every mitzvah, every syllable of the Jewish story, every element of Jewish law is a protest against escapism, resignation, or the blind acceptance of fate. Judaism is a sustained struggle, the greatest ever known against the world that is, in the name of the world that could be, should be, but is not yet. He continues, there is no more challenging vocation. Throughout history, when human beings have sought hope, they have found it in the Jewish story. Judaism is the religion and Israel the home of hope. Anne Klein was a lovely woman with a sweet smile and a calming personality. I first got to know her when we saw each other at various arts and crafts events, always at the winter and spring fairs at Thomas Jefferson Unitarian Church. Yes, we met a lot while shopping. Why not? I remember asking her one time, and that was sometime in the 1990s, if she would want to speak about her Holocaust experiences to a small group of students in Trimble County, specifically Trimble County Middle School. I believe it was the first time that she had shared her story to a larger group. And like most survivors, she was a bit hesitant to share, but was motivated to make sure that our young people learned the truth. The students were not only moved by her story, but they fell in love with her. And after she spoke, she was moved to tears as she was presented with a bouquet of flowers. Beginning in 2005, Fred Whitaker and St. Francis of Assisi eighth graders in Louisville had annually lobbied the Kentucky legislature to pass a Holocaust education bill. I joined the students lobbying years before. And in 2018, Linda Klein, Anne's daughter, joined us. On April 2, 2018, the Anne Klein and Fred Gross Holocaust Education Act was signed into law by the governor. And under the act, each public middle and high school in Kentucky must include in its curriculum instruction the story of the Holocaust and other acts of genocide. And I'm not to have my name forever etched with ends on this important legislation. It is fitting that we are honoring Anne and Sandy Klein tonight on the third anniversary of the passage of that law. Their family has created a special presentation reflecting on their lives and their ability to overcome adversity. Now more than ever, we can be inspired by Anne and Sandy's example 
for how to live a joyous life, even through dark time. And you'll be hearing the voices of Anne and Sandy's grandson, Zach Kleinsmith, as he shares his memories with all of us. Thank you very much, Fred, for your introduction. I'm truly grateful that my family and I have been invited here to this virtual day of remembrance and that we've been given the opportunity to share some thoughts and memories about my grandparents. We're told to remember historical events, particularly those that involve tragedy and loss of life. Remember the Alamo. Remember 9-11. On Yom HaShoah, we remember the Holocaust. Remembering is a way to honor those lost in the hopes that such tragedies won't repeat themselves. We listen to the stories of survivors. These living monuments to tragic injustice remind us what we're capable of at our best and at our worst. When they leave us, we are left grappling with a dilemma. How do we continue to remember the events they lived through without them here to teach us? Who can we look up to as reminders of what is possible in life and who will show us that we can overcome anything life throws at us? My grandmother, Anne Klein, or Anyu as we called her, died in the winter of 2012. Just five months before, she'd been dancing beneath the stars at a hotel rooftop in New York at my wedding. But that winter, we all gathered around in her small hospice room to say goodbye. We tried to soak up every last bit of what she had to offer. We shared in her joy and in her story. She requested songs and we obliged, singing and playing fiddle tunes while she lay in bed sipping wonton soup and caramel milkshakes. As everyone listens when I start to sing, I'm so grateful and proud. All I want is to sing it out loud. Visitors poured in. And being quite the example of both generosity and boundaries, she accepted some and politely declined others. Hers was a dignified death, very much like her life, surrounded by those she loved, listening to music, and radiating quiet strength through pain. Five years later, my grandfather Sandy, or Apu as we called him, joined her. Although he declined a bit since my grandmother's departure, he spent the last years of his life staying very busy. He continued to attend classical music concerts, the opera, and art museums. He enjoyed going out to eat, watching Rachel Maddow, and reading articles from The New Yorker. I am so grateful that both of my grandparents were able to attend our wedding, and my grandfather even got to meet my son, Andy, his great-grandson. We named Andy after my grandmother. As is common in the Jewish tradition, we honored her by taking the first initial of her name and assigning it to our own child's name after her death. But there was another reason we chose that name for our son. We named him for Anyu and Apu's firstborn, my uncle, Andy Klein, who died in 1999 at the age of 50. He had suffered an accident in his freshman year of college in 1966 that left him a paraplegic. That event was a defining moment in the life of my grandparents and our family. More about that later. I was asked to speak about my grandparents' life and about resilience. And when referring to Anne and Sandy Klein and speaking about resilience, it's hard to know exactly where to start but the beginning seems as good a place as any. They were born in Eger, Hungary in 1920 and 21. They'd known each other as children and attended the Jewish elementary school together. They were even in the school Purim play. Anyu was a ballerina and Apu was a clown. They both took music lessons and would play duets together, Apu on the violin and Anyu on the piano. Eventually, they became sweethearts. In 1938, big changes came for my grandfather. His uncle, Elmer Klein, who had emigrated to the United States at age 14, was visiting Hungary on his honeymoon with his new American bride. 
He and Sandy's father, who suspected that things were going to get worse in Europe, made plans for Sandy to come to Washington, D.C., where Elmer could take charge of his education. And so, at age 18, my grandfather left his life in Hungary. While in D.C., he kept in touch, writing letters to his parents, his two sisters, and to my grandmother. On my grandmother's birthday, he even asked his mother to make sure that Anne got a hundred red roses. They kept writing until the war broke out and they all lost touch. My grandfather enlisted in the army, was assigned to radio signal school, became a U.S. citizen, and was stationed in North Africa. When the war in Europe ended, Sandy used his leave and spent 40 days traveling between Allied military zones to locate his sisters and bring them to Casablanca, where he was stationed. My grandmother's experiences during the war, on the other hand, were quite different. She lived with her parents and brothers under increasingly restrictive conditions. In 1944, the Germans invaded Hungary, and my grandmother and her family were put in ghettos and later taken to Auschwitz. Luckily for her, she was assigned to the kitchen where the little food she was able to steal allowed her to barter with other inmates for items that helped her survive. See, we'll take this upstairs. And in here, I can show you certain things which involves me okay. or involves my husband. Are those all the old pictures, or are they some then new they ones, would too? They would be old. Well, yeah, well, you're not interested in very new right this Not moment. too much, yeah. I mean, like, that's easy. Yeah, we can find those later. Yeah. Sadly, Anya lost her parents and both of her brothers. As the war turned against the Germans, she nearly froze in the infamous death march into Germany before being liberated by Russian troops. The journey was forever etched on her being as a bout of laryngitis brought on by the cold gave her sweet voice the unique raspiness that we all came to know. This is, this is a school play in a Jewish elementary school where I was in third grade and, and Apu was in fourth grade. On this picture, that's me. That's a kind of a Hungarian outfit, costume. And here, that's me, and that's Apu. Wow. Isn't that nice? My grandparents were resilient, all right. After learning my grandmother had survived, my grandfather sent her a letter proposing marriage and a second shot at a happy life in the United States. She said yes and arrived at Ellis Island in January 1947 to begin anew. They had spent nine years apart and were married on January 29th, nine days after she arrived. They then spent their newlywed years struggling. While Apu was in school, earning a Ph.D. in psychology, Anya became a mother, nursing and caring for an infant in a mobile home with no running water. They went on to have three more children, Elizabeth in 1950, my mother Linda in 1954, and Robert in 1960. Throughout the children's youth, my grandmother didn't speak too much about the Holocaust. She was hesitant to let her Jewish identity be known to new acquaintances and friends in the U.S. She didn't know whether or not it was safe. The trauma she'd suffered made her think her religion was something to hide and keep close. It wasn't until my mom and her siblings were older that my grandmother felt safe opening up about the events of the Holocaust and sharing her story and speaking openly about being Jewish. Living through the events I've described would make anyone resilient. There's no denying that the type of suffering my grandparents endured was worse than what most people can imagine living through in their lifetime. The murder of several family members, leaving their homeland as refugees, starting a new life and a family with little to no familial support or financial resources. These are incredible and amazing circumstances to have overcome. And yet they did. 
Many who knew my grandparents marveled at their demeanor. Both of them radiated joy and enthusiasm. Both of them enjoyed meeting new people, hearing new stories, and my grandmother was particularly adept at making people feel warm and fuzzy with her generosity, her sweet smile, and her famously infectious laugh. They loved listening to classical music and opera together. They enjoyed taking in art and making Hungarian dishes like pogacha and nukedli. Their home was warm, inviting, and filled with memories of the lives of their four children. Although they lost nearly all the family they had in Hungary, they made a new family, and that family made new family. One of their joys was taking pictures of the growing family on the steps of their home. Although their story isn't unique, it is uniquely American. Many who've landed on the shores of this nation did so following deep trauma. Genocide, starvation, war, these are the reasons so many of us exist as the American descendants of our immigrant ancestors. Immigrants define resilience, hard work, and optimism, and my grandparents were fine examples of this. Their resilience was tested when my Uncle Andy was a freshman in college in Appleton, Wisconsin. He fell 30 feet while exploring an abandoned church and was in a coma for several days and nearly died. His accident forever changed my family's lives. My grandmother later recalled this event in many interviews she gave, speaking about her fear for Andy's future and the gratitude she felt for the family of strangers who offered her a home while she cared for Andy in the hospital until he could be brought back to Louisville. No one should have to bury a child, is how the saying goes. And yet, Anyu and Apu did when my uncle Andy passed away in 1999. Anyu recalled this moment and how she'd retreat to her basement to cry while listening to Schubert's Death and the Maiden a piece she told Andy she wanted played at her own funeral. Although she didn't like to show emotion to many people, she cried over Andy's death in private and was comforted again by the gift of music. She said she felt grateful to have a place for Andy in Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville and made sure that she and my grandfather had burial plots next to him. She was happy to know there would be a place for them all. It would be easy to mistake my grandmother for an optimist, or a person of great faith and trust in a higher power. After all, we sometimes need a method of belief to get through hard times. But in truth, she was a joyous person who was also a realist. Her eyes were open. The tragedies she'd experienced in her life shaped the way she viewed the world. We asked her if she believed in heaven before she died. She said she didn't, although she'd love to see Andy again. She said when Andy died, she realized life was not fair and that there was no justice, no rhyme or reason to why things happen. Bad things just happen. That's not a flowery viewpoint, but it was how she saw the world. And I can't think of anything more resilient than seeing the world exactly as it is, warts and all, and getting up every day anyway. We now find ourselves at a place in history when it's hard not to see the warts and all world that we live in. I've honestly spent a lot of time feeling grateful that my grandparents haven't been alive to see the prominent rise of anti-Semitism in mainstream American politics, or to live through the global pandemic. After a year of the endurance test of isolation and boredom and grief brought on by the coronavirus, we're all left wondering how to cope and what the meaning of life may be. As my grandmother pondered, is there a rhyme or reason for any of it? What did Anyu and Apu do to overcome some of the greatest hardships in life? 
According to the American Psychological Association, finding resilience is not unlike building a muscle. There are methods and a practice to overcoming deep psychological trauma such as profound loss. Whether or not they realized it, my grandparents found and implemented many of these strategies in their own lives. Positive outlets. As a tool for survival, my grandparents found music. They found community, art, and food. They took classes. My grandmother loved Tai Chi and folk dancing. My grandfather read the paper and cursed at conservatives on television. They poured their love into their children, grandchildren, and our interests like music, sports, and theater. These forms of positive outlets can help us heal from trauma and find resilience, just as they did. So, listen to music when you can. Look at a sculpture. Hand a child an instrument and applaud when they do their best. Find the tiny light in every speck of expression and breathe toward it until it glows. That's what my grandparents did. Gratitude. We know that gratitude is healing. But what we don't often reflect on is that it is sometimes in our deepest moments of darkness, at the emptiness and hollowness, at the peak of vulnerability, that we are able to see our gifts most clearly. For my grandmother, it was the family who offered her a home to stay while she was with Andy, and the friends in Louisville, as well as her niece, Kati, from Argentina, who helped care for her husband and children while she was away. It was a stone plaque with her son's name on it, and knowing there was a space beside him for her to rest. Gratitude for my grandparents wasn't just being thankful. It was finding peace in the small things, playing and listening to music, a meal with friends, a lending hand, these are the things we have to be grateful for. And I wish us all the clarity to find this thankfulness at every moment, but particularly in our moments of suffering. Purpose. Therapists call finding a sense of purpose the resilience or growth phase following a trauma. When someone is willing to take up the mantle of the cause, perhaps even one that caused them damage, they find a sense of purpose in educating and giving to others. This is called tikkun olam in Judaism, giving back to make the world free from suffering. My grandmother learned to take her experience of suffering during the Holocaust and use it as a tool to teach peace in hopes that it would never happen to anyone again. This process first began when her good friend Mary Kay Takau, a history professor at the University of Louisville, urged her to record her story on tape. From this experience, she gained confidence and, with the encouragement of several local Holocaust educators, ended up speaking hundreds of times about her experiences to church groups, school groups, and different organizations throughout the rest of her life. Her influence continued after her death with the passage of the Anne Klein Fred Gross Holocaust Education Bill in March of 2018, which was championed by students she had inspired at St. Francis of Assisi Parochial School. It requires that Holocaust education be included in every Kentucky high school curriculum. In opening up about her painful past, I'd like to believe that she found, if not joy, peace, knowing that she was teaching people how to create a better world by not repeating the mistakes of the past. Social support. Therapists say that social support is a powerful tool for healing and resilience. Finding like-minded individuals who have suffered similar trauma can create a bond and healing. For my grandparents, this meant not only finding support from friends and family, but also offering support to people in their community. My grandmother was involved in her children's schools through the PTA. She volunteered frequently and sometimes played piano for school plays. She became a mentor to a young teenager, remaining friends with her throughout her adult life. She helped several Hungarian refugees adjust to life in the United States. Before her death, 
she encouraged her children to set up the Anne Klein Memorial Fund for Holocaust Education through the Community Foundation of Louisville. This fund has assisted students to visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and has sponsored Holocaust educators to attend programs in Poland. My grandfather was also very civic-minded. He served on the board of the Parc Duval Community Health Center. He was one of the first child psychologists in Louisville, and I know that many adults later told him how much he had helped them as troubled children. He welcomed friends and relatives into his home, listening to their problems and offering support. He also passionately promoted opera to anyone who would listen. My grandparents supported each other. Theirs was a love warmed by shared experience, a shared homeland, and shared suffering. This is what deep love can be made of. This is another way we can give and receive support. We named my son after my grandmother, but we also named him for her Andy. You see, my wife knew that as a mother, there would be no greater gift to give than to keep the memory of another mother's son alive. But I've also always believed that you should name a child for the person whose gifts you'd like to bestow. And for my son, I can think of no greater set of gifts than to be just like my grandmother. Just like Anya. My wish for him is the same for all of us. That we find strength in adversity. That we reach out to others for support. That we find joy in the everyday gifts of music, food, love, and laughter that we find purpose in sharing our stories, and that we feel deep gratitude in the depths of extreme vulnerability and suffering. My wish is for my son Andy to be like Anu and Apu. My wish is for him to carry on their legacy in the practice of living life to its fullest, despite and sometimes because of suffering. I believe we now all have the opportunity to practice these skills. In the midst of uncertainty, of reckoning, of illness, of isolation, may we find a way forward looking to the examples of people like my grandparents. For we are the ancestors leading the way and carving a path for those yet to be. How we weather this storm will light the way forward for people like my son. And so we shine as dimly and hopefully as a flickering, fragile light in a dark night, remembering that all we need to do is keep going. Resilience is simply the practice we find along the way.
Hi, my name is Matt Goldberg, and I'm the Director of Community Relations for the Jewish Federation of Louisville. Earlier this year, two students at DuPont Manual High School's journalism program, Satchel and Cooper Walton, they wrote a series of articles in the school's Red Eye newspaper, which uncovered disturbing use of anti-Semitic language and imagery, including referencing Nazis in some training modules used by some of our state police agencies. Their outstanding journalism has not gone unnoticed. They've received national attention for their work, and this has become a catalyst for change in police training in Kentucky. Earlier this year, the Jewish Community of Louisville's Board of Directors presented Satchel and Cooper with a commendation for their groundbreaking work. Today, we'd like to honor Satchel and Cooper and their teachers, Liz Palmer and James Miller. It takes courage to speak truth to power, and it takes courage to support students in using their voices for change. It's appropriate that we honor all four this evening. We've seen all too well what happens when people are silent when there should be an outcry. So in the context of remembering the Shoah, the Holocaust, and remembering the lives lost within so many of our community's families, we again thank you and the DuPont Manual High School Journalism Program for stepping up and using the power of your words. Our hope lies in the next generation and in their mentors. In the spirit of teacher mentorship and student voices, it is now my privilege to introduce Fred Whitaker, renowned Holocaust educator and teacher. It is altogether fitting that in each April, perched between the darkness and frost of winter and the warmth and light of spring and its promise of new life, that we stop to look both backwards at the grief and ashes of the Shoah, as well as forward into the hope and healing and understanding which might one day blossom if we bind ourselves tightly to the responsibilities of assuring that remembrance of the Holocaust never ceases to occur. As we look to the future, we must look into the hearts and hands of the next generation of our youth. It will be into those places that we gather our memories and recollections, the stories which define the Holocaust's infinite darkness and those which describe the moments of courage, defiance and resiliency created by its victims and survivors. It becomes both a blessing and a burden to become the individuals who carry the, these memories forward. But it is one that we ask our youth to take on each year. And it is our blessing that each year many say they will. This year, speaking for the youth of the next generation, committing to carrying forward the memories which define both the show as midnight and the luminance of its wisdom and light is St. Francis of Assisi student, Mary Shea Valentine. Hello, my name is Mary Shea Ballantyne, and I'm an eighth grade student at the St. Francis of Assisi School. Every year, the eighth grade class journeys deeply into the study of the Holocaust. It is a place where we confront with courage, compassion, and prayer, human nature at its very worst and at its very best. As we take our first steps towards understanding what the Holocaust was and how it could have happened, we encounter an abundance of names and dates, numbers and statistics, maps, and place names. It is a wilderness of the kind of knowledge which makes us wonder, how will we ever remember this? But as we meet those who lost their lives in the Shoah and others who survived, like Mrs. Ann and Mr. Sander Klein, who carried the burden of its memories for their entire lives, the confusion melts away. It is in that moment, as we connect soul to soul with the people whose lives were forever changed by the Holocaust, that we begin to understand this history a history filled with memories and wisdom which will be written across our hearts forever and will, be, and will become impossible for us to ever forget. As young people, we are profoundly eager to know that there are people in the world who are truly strong. We seek heroes who are challenged by adversity or tragedy and who responded by searching in their spirits and souls for sources of strength which made them resilient and strong. Mrs. Ann Klein inspired all of us to persevere using love and passion. The hope she has given so many young people inspires us all to be resilient in the hardest of times and even in the easiest. The Klein Smith family has honored us by sharing their memories of Mr. and Mrs. Sander Klein. There's no amount of thanks that could repay the inspiration their stories have given us. My generation has been asked to carry forward the remembrance of the Holocaust. We've been asked to never forget. We know exactly what that means. 
the Shoah calls us into the deepest wisdom that humanity has to teach. It summons us with unique power into making this wisdom our own and into understanding that we are not too young to create. With the things we do, powerful moments which bring compassion, hope and healing to our world. Unlike the millions of people who stood by and did nothing as they watched their Jewish neighbors being carried away to the death camps, we now realize that we have been called to step meaningfully into the lives of others and that we may no longer remain silent when we witness injustice. As if we had stood on the sun, that part of our lives which allowed us to be indifferent to the suffering and pain of others has been burned away by what we have learned. And our voices must be used to speak up for people who have been forgotten or marginalized. Our words must be spoken with conviction so that we may protect the dignity of all who have been made silent or invisible. Our hands must be raised, not against our brothers and sisters, but an outreach to them, so that we may uplift anyone who has been pushed beyond the boundaries of society's caring and concern. By learning and remembering, we students of all ages will place them into the refuge of our hearts. We understand that having true strength means leaping daily from our comfort zones into the lives of all those who suffer and holding on to hope even in the most hopeless of times. It means creating family with our Jewish brothers and sisters and finding solidarity with all the people that we meet. To do these things in the name of those lives which were lost in the Shoah and in honor of those who survived is to proclaim to the world that the memories of the Shoah will be carried forward by a generation which truly understands what it means to remember. We are members of that generation. Knees Corps, we will not ever forget. <laughs> As we move into the candle lighting part of our program, we will light 11 memorial candles for the 11 million lives lost. We will honor members of our community with personal connections to the Holocaust and name many types of victims of the Shoah. The candle lighting will be narrated by students of Louisville Beit Sefer Yachad, also known as LBSY, and by students of St. Francis of Assisi. I'd like to share the very inspiring words from the poem, The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman, the poem she read at President Biden's inauguration. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. The first candle will be lit in honor of Thelma and Sherry Marks in remembrance of Holocaust survivor and educator Ernie Marks. We light the first candle in memory of all the mothers who died with their children in their arms. Knees core, we will not forget. The second candle will be lit in honor of Madeline and Suzanne Gus in remembrance of liberator Donald Gus. We light the second candle in memory of the resistance fighters and heroic World War II veterans who battled the Nazis in defense of home, independence, and humanity. Nice Corps, we will not forget. The third candle will be lit in honor of Holocaust survivor Dan Streit. We light the third candle in memory of all the fathers and mothers who were torn from their families. Nice Corps, we will not forget. The fourth candle will be lit in honor of Linda Klein's daughter of survivor Anne and Sandor Klein. We lit the fourth candle in memory of the political activists, scholars, teachers, and rabbis who were the first to be taken. These course we will not forget. The fifth candle will be lit in honor of Janet Jakubowicz in remembrance of her father, Holocaust survivor Abe Jakubowicz. We light the fifth candle in memory of the of the women and men who fled to the forests and who lived to fight the Nazis. Knees core, we will not forget. The sixth candle will be lit in honor of Holocaust educators Dan Penner and Shannon Kaderis. We light the sixth candle in memory of the martyrs who gave their lives so that others might live. 
Knees core, we will not forget. The seventh candle will be lit in honor of Hans Bensinger. We light the seventh candle in memory of the millions of unarmed civilians, Soviets, Poles, Slavs, and countless others who were murdered in blind retaliation for the smallest of Nazi losses. Nice Corps, we will not forget. The eighth candle will be lit in honor of Fred Whitaker, Holocaust educator whose students have been instrumental in the passing of two Holocaust education bills in Kentucky. We will light the eighth candle for those who oppose Nazi rule. Among them, shopkeepers, students, lawyers, peddlers, conservatives, socialists, communists, Catholics, and Protestants. In these core, we will not forget. The ninth candle will be lit in honor of Anne Dorsbeck. We light the ninth candle in memory of those groups of innocent human beings deemed subhuman by the Nazis, homosexuals, gypsies, and the mentally ill. Knees core, we will not forget. The 10th candle will be in honor of Elias Klein, a US Army veteran who fought in World War II. We light the 10th candle in memory of the righteous Gentiles who risked and often gave their lives to shelter Jews. Knees core, we will not forget. The 11th candle will be lit in honor of Fred Gross and Jonathan Gross and all of our community's survivors and their descendants. From your homes, if you wish to light a Yarzit candle at this time, please join us for the 11th candle. The 11th candle will be lit by all survivors and their descendants in the audience. We light the 11th candle in memory of the infants, children, and teenagers who were cut down like young trees before their time. Nice core, we will not forget. <laughs>
join me in this reading of the Kaddish adapted by Elie Wiesel. Uh, we can read together even if the microphones are muted. The silence and the speaking, it speaks volumes for this moment. Yit Kadal, Auschwitz, Yit Kadash, Dachau, Shmei Raba, Warsaw, Balma Divra Chirute, Bogdanovka, Viam Lich Malchute, Ravensbrook, Bahaya Khon of Yomechon Vilna, Ubhaye de Hol Beit Israel, Trablinka, Bagala Ubisman Kariv Chelmno, Vimru, Amen. Yeheshme Rabam of Orach Melam Ulme Olmayo, Yit Barach Vishtabach Belzek, Vit Paar Vit Romam Buchenwald, Vit Nase Vietadar Sobobor, Vit Ale Vietalal Madainik. Shme de Kurisha Berichu, Mauthausen. Leila Lotz, Mikol Birchata Veshirata Bavia. Tush Bechata Venechemata, Syria. Damiran Bialma Vimru Ame, Burma. Yehe Shlama Raba, Armenia. Min Shemaya, Bosnia. Bechaim, Rwanda. Alena ve Alkol Israel, Vimru Ame. Ose Shalom Bim Romav, Darfur. Who ya say shalom? Alenu al kol Yisrael. The imru. Amen. We have just experienced a very moving program. Yom HaShoah is a day for each of us to set aside time to remember the Holocaust. Learning about the lives of Sandy and Anne Klein is an important reminder of a generation that must never be forgotten. We have heard about two beautiful people whose lives are an inspiration. 
Typical of survivors, Anne and Sandy epitomized resilience, courage, and in the case of Anne, the ability to survive. Anne and Sandy Klein's journey is also a beautiful love story. They had two hearts that beat as one. Together they transcended their pain, heartache, and losses to make a new life in the United States. Imagine our loss if the gates of freedom had been shut. Anne and Sandy are a reminder during this difficult time to find joy in life in the face of so much being taken from us. Despite unimaginable loss, life can go on if we choose to live joyfully and with gratitude. We can transcend personal pain and loss with goodness and caring for others. This is the lesson of Anne and Sandy Klein's life. On this Yom HaShoah, let us pray that the examples set by Anne and Sandy Klein and by all whom we remember today will inspire us to show love and concern for those who are persecuted. Today, we remember and reflect on the lives of the six million Jews and other innocent victims who perished in the Shoah. May this memory inspire us to perform Gimilut Chasadim, deeds of loving kindness. We pray, O oh God, that we will never forget those who perished in the Shoah. May our deeds bring honor to their memory and to you. Amen. Yalla la 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 la